Welcome to Simplify. I'm Caitlin Schiller. And I'm Benjamin Soller. Hello. We're back. All right. This is very exciting. Today we've got Daniel Mate, who is the son of the illustrious Gabor Mate. The book is called The Myth of Normal, Trauma, Illness, and Healing in a Toxic Culture. If you've been in a bookstore in the recent past, if you've walked by a bookstore, it's been in the window. And someone you know has probably read it and probably talked to you about it. This book is kind of a big deal because it looks at the way that society is currently set up and the way that Western culture just is, is kind of making everybody sick. Mm -hmm. How there is no longer any such thing as normal or rather normal is a harmful condition and label for human beings because we're all kind of set up differently to cope differently with what the current living situation is. And the current living situation is sort of antithetical to life. We work all the time. We don't listen to our bodies. We're really stressed out. We eat poorly. Our medical system is in a shambles. Um, we're lonely. This we're is lonely. uplifting. This is an uplifting <laughs> conversation. But it kind of is uplifting because the core message of it is that normal has become something that we're all kind of trained to equalize toward, even though we really shouldn't be doing that. And whatever kind of abnormal you are, is probably okay in one way or another because there's sense behind it. People with ADHD have ADHD for a reason. People who are suffering from depression are suffering from depression for a reason that, you know, can be physiological things, but it's also environmental. And today I talk with Daniel more about the macro elements of these ideas because he's not on the clinical side like his dad Gabor Mate is. He's on the more um, cultural history side. We talk about how this happened. And what we can do in order to maintain our health and well-being and selves in a world that increasingly doesn't make sense and is not built to sustain flourishing human life. Wow. I mean, it, it shows what's at stake for sure. So I think we should play it. Yeah. You've recommended a lot of Gabor Mate books I have. over the years on Simplify. So maybe we can dig into sort of how this book fits into the Mate family book history. Yeah, sure. Yeah? Let's do that. Okay. Great. Let's hear the interview with Daniel Mate. Here we go. Hi, Daniel. Thanks so much for joining me today. Before we get going here, I, I would just love it if you could introduce yourself the way that you like to be introduced. Well, my name is Daniel Mate. I am Canadian born, but currently New York settled. I'm here in Brooklyn. I've lived a good part of my adult life here in a couple of different stints. I first moved here in 2005 to go to grad school at NYU for a master's of fine arts in musical theater writing, of all things. These days, I'd say that my day job or my money gig or whatever you want to say would be these books that I've been writing with a certain collaborator, my father. We had our first one come out in September, The Myth of Normal. We're working on a second one now. I also run a side business called Mental Chiropractic, and I call it Take a Walk with Daniel because I deliver it while walking with people. What's the through line for you? Well, I guess a couple of through lines would be always wanting to interrogate what's under the surface. Mm -hmm. And I think that on the flip side of that, what I'm always going for is a kind of crystallization of something where at the end of a walk with me, I want people to walk away feeling lucid, feeling like something has become crystallized, something that was muddy or indistinct or frustratingly kind of elusive becomes really clear. Like, okay, right, there it is. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I kind of live for those moments. I don't have the therapist's inclination to sit patiently for a long time. So yeah, I'm always looking for the most precise way of saying or expressing what's going on. And I, um, I want to give that to others. I want to give people the experience of seeing things in as sharp relief as possible. And, and so I use that as sort of a, a guidance system for, for what I try to get up to in life. Yeah. It sounds like you're always seeking to find the unity of feeling and expression in a way that feels accessible and true for whoever you're addressing with the question you're asking or the art that you're making. I would say so. And, and add it into the mix. Um, perception as well, mm. feeling and expression. You know, the chiropractic metaphor is very useful because what does a chiropractor do? And, you know, the idea of it is that we're bringing things into alignment. Well, alignment with what? There's no such thing as free-floating, abstract, non-referential alignment. Alignment is always in reference or relationship to something, mm -hmm. some 
ideal configuration of things. So when it comes to the human spine or nervous system, there are certain parameters inside which it operates at its maximum capacity. And when things are out, you know, a vertebra, a centimeter out of whack is terrible, even a few millimeters, you know, like there's something that happens when things are in alignment. And when it comes to the mind, there's so many different things we could align with. Well, you could align with your feelings, right? You could align all your perceptions with your feelings, but that is not the most reliable gauge. Mm -hmm. Feelings are important. They're data. They're data, but feelings are not facts on their own. You know, they're good signposts. Thoughts are just as unreliable, if not more, because I can't control the kinds of thoughts. I I wouldn't want all my thoughts to come true. That's a horror movie. Oh my God, no. That that happened happened at the end of Ghostbusters with the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man pops into Dan Aykroyd's head and all of a sudden it's marching down the Sixth Avenue, you know? (laughs) So, you know, there's our prejudices, which obviously we wouldn't want to make manifest Mm. all the time. There's our beliefs, which are tricky, our values, which are sometimes a little murky. For me, it's the intentions. Mm. And in order for our experience to line up with our intentions, we have to get really straight about our perceptions. We have to, you know, look at how am I looking at this? Mm. So perception is an important piece of lining up. Finding a language to speak about something that's difficult Mm. means finding new ways of looking at it. And in seeing it, we find new ways of saying it and vice versa. When you can speak about something in a new way, all of a sudden it gives rise to a new point of view and a new point of view can give rise to a new experience. What you were just saying about perception and how there's the problem of perception and that we can never really see entirely what another person is seeing, although we try to approximate it. It makes me think about the title of the book that we are nominally here to discuss today, which is (laughs) The Myth of Normal. And normal is a really problematic word. It's a problematic perception from any angle at which you look at it, because much like in chiropractics, you have to respect the fact that individual alignment is really quite variable and individual normal is also really quite variable. But so much of the sickness and the problematic stuff that comes out of culture these days is that we have this idea of what normal needs to be and should be. Well, you know, the things about making things crystal clear is to define your terms and to make sure that we look at what can normal mean and what do we mean by it. So in the introduction, we say that normal has some uses and it has some non-problematic uses. You could just be talking about statistical norms. And in the medical field, it's helpful to know what normal pH levels are in the blood or normal oxygen levels or the normal range of temperatures, for instance, that human beings can exist in, you know. In fact, the entire discipline of looking at climate change is uh, about sounding the alarm that things are going beyond the norms, not in the sense of some kind of moral opinion, but just some kind of physical fact. As far as we know, life happens within certain parameters. Another way of talking about normal would be sort of probabilities and prevalence of something so that someone can put their own situation in context. So if, you know, if someone is experiencing certain symptoms, a doctor could say to them, oh, don't worry, that's normal. It's to be expected. The first version of normal is kind of optimal or appropriate conditions. The second one is to be expected within a certain context. That's not the sense in which we're using the word normal in the title. The myth of normal is like an agreed upon but never explicitly agreed upon set of norms and assumptions that we make about who human beings are, what human beings need, and what health looks like, really. Because the subtitle of the book is Trauma, Illness, and Healing in a Toxic Culture. With regard to, in fact, all four of the components in that subtitle, trauma, illness, healing, and culture, the norms that have the most consequence that dictate the quality and sometimes the duration of our lives are the invisible ones, the ones we never consciously agreed to. Mm. For instance, one of the central theses of the book would be that trauma is so normal in our society as to be invisible. Now, what happens when we get fractured inside at a young age? There's two ways to sustain an injury, right? something bad can happen or something good cannot happen. Not just good, but necessary. Mm -hmm. And human beings are born with certain needs. Mm -hmm. 
So there's all kinds of ways besides the big T traumatic stereotypical calamities that we usually think of when we think of the word trauma. And many of us in this society are carrying those wounds, the wounds of not having been seen or heard, the wounds of having had to work too hard to get the sort of baseline love and attention that we needed. Now, what happens when there's an injury? Well, the body or the spirit or the nervous system or whatever whatever you want to call it has to cope with it in some way. And you can develop a scar or we can overcompensate in other areas. And what ends up happening is that when it comes to our psychology and our emotions, we develop coping personality traits Mm -hmm. to make up for what was lost. And there's all kinds of ways in which this can happen. You know, one of the most prototypical that we write about in the book that my dad often focuses on is people who become people pleasers Mm -hmm. to safeguard a threatened relationship with the caregiver. So in in the compromised supply of that, we, we need to do something. Well, if me doing things that will displease is a threat to my survival, well, I better not, and I better get really good at pleasing people. Mm-hmm. Then I end up being a quote unquote people pleaser. And that is not only normalized then when I get older, but it's praised and uh, rewarded and incentivized. Right. In the workplace, especially if I'm a woman in the romantic, sexual, spousal space by our society, you know, not just women, but especially. And then the ultimate normalization is I think that's who I am. It's not that I remember, oh yeah, you know what? I stuffed away my Mm. healthy anger somewhere. Let me, you know, we lock it away, throw away the key and forget that there was ever a door. Absolutely. And that's how it becomes the personality. And then we think the personality is who we are. So, and then things get normalized at the societal level, right? Many people took this healthcare system that we have here, this private healthcare system, as just normal. To some extent, we are all living in a society where how we cope with the lack of what we need is often what's taken to be what a successful human life is. And the only problem with that is nature disagrees. Mm. And that disagreement, that clash, that non alignment results in illness of all kinds, malaise, various afflictions, addiction all kinds of stuff. You know, that may sound like a logical leap, but there's all kinds of science behind it, which that's not my department. The book gets into it very well. Mm -hmm. My dad did most of the research on that, but it's, you know, it's pretty persuasive and it makes sense if you think about it, because we are not just separate minds and bodies. It's all one system. Of course, the Western medical system normalizes a dualistic view that says these things can be separated and the different body parts can be separate. Anyway, I'm going on and on. As you can see, it's normal as a big can of worms. Yeah, it's it's the takeaway for the book for me is that our bodies are a part of a cultural and environmental body. And if the way that these bodies brush up against one another is not taken into account, we feel ill. And then we're asked to live in that malaise without ever acknowledging that it's sick. And that we're sick. That's right. So the malaise that we feel inside of ourselves is manifested as perfectly, or it's it's said to be perfectly normal. And there's so little room to bring up the fact that this water that we're swimming in is not normal. Not at all. And we use the metaphor of fish not knowing what water is, right? Mm -hmm. David Foster Wallace told a really funny story about that, uh, our little parable. And it goes further and it gets worse than just normalization because these things get praised. Yeah. I mean, even the term egoless sounds like a compliment, but everyone needs a healthy ego. Children have to develop a sense of self before they can feel connected to the world. And then obviously the full circle spiritual journey would be to, in a sense, dissolve the ego's hold on ourselves and have a sense of our greater capital S self. Yeah. But it's not about being selfless. You know, you could turn that around and saying that's being less than yourself. Exactly. And we don't, we, we're not born like that. We learn that fully being ourselves is a luxury we can't afford. Mm-hmm. And of course, having it kind of melt into the personality and fuse with the personality is a pretty reliable way of making sure that it'll endure right. because I won't question it. So you just said, you know, we, we society lionizes these traits, selflessness, being egoless, uh, being self-sacrificing, even being, quote, normal to an extent. And I'm talking about the kind of normal that we can just throw out as a really easy pat definition. Sure. What's in it for culture? Why? Why do we lionize these things? Yeah, well, that's a really good question. And that brings us to the the sort of, if I wanted to be reductive about it, I could say it's capitalism. It's not 
hypothetical. We're living under near totalized global capitalism. You could ask, well, what does the system itself, which and systems are built to perpetuate themselves, it needs a certain normal. Mm -hmm. Every system needs something to be taken to be normal. Otherwise, the system will be under constant scrutiny and, and threat. And it also takes more work. I'm thinking about like trying to scale any kind of process. You need a template that has to exist in order to have more. In order to follow an imperative for growth, you need normal, you need a template. Well, that's right. Well, what sort of norms are required? Well, first of all, you have to start to believe that that is what human beings want and need, that the human nature leads to that outcome kind of inexorably. If you just leave it alone, the free market of evolution is going to lead to that kind of system. Well, what kind of beings must we be then if that's the case? Well, we must be selfish, self-interested, competitive, ruthless. Okay, Hobbes, yep. (laughs) No doubt, right? In other words, if if we can be sold that that's just who we are, then the system we're living in is normal and good. See, if we if we questioned that norm, well, maybe people wouldn't be buying all the crap that they buy. Maybe they would reach for things like community and solidarity and common sense of purpose and the outdoors and things that you can't as easily commodify. Mm-hmm. If we take our alienation to be normal, then we're going to seek external relief for it. Again, it all links back to biology. There's all kinds of studies in the book showing that stress, which is the the common factor in both trauma and illness, is very much tied to uncertainty and loss of control. And you couldn't describe our economic system any better. I should also say that it's not just that people pleasing and niceness is normalized in this kind of society. That's good for a good sector of the population. You need other types of people to be conditioned to run the system. Well, those people would be the ruthless kind. Mm. And that shows up in some of our leaders as well. And we have a whole chapter on how our politics is completely based on wounding. Mm. We have wounded leaders being elected by a wounded population, looking for parental replacements Mm -hmm. and finding them in these outsized personalities and egos, which appeal to different sectors of the society, depending on what sort of wounds, hopes, dreams, fantasies that sector is carrying, right? Mm -hmm. So if we take a step back, we see that from top to bottom, pain and normalized, unacknowledged, invisibilized trauma is built into the system, which then perpetuates more of it and so on and so on, which is what makes the book hopefully subversive. When things are normal and mainstream, it's very easy to dismiss anything that challenges their precepts. You don't have to do too much work. You know, Noam Chomsky said this about politics and media, right? If you only have three minutes between commercials to say something unconventional and subversive that people haven't considered before, well, that's a lot harder to make your case than it is if you've got all the airtime and all the oxygen in the world. Mm. But the lovely thing about publishing a book in 2022, 2023 is we don't have to rely on legacy media. I mean, where has the vast majority of the promotion for the book happened? It's happened on podcasts and Instagram lives. Mm. You know, my dad got to go on the Joe Rogan show and speak to millions of people Mm -hmm. who are listening for free to extended conversations about lots of topics, whatever you think of that show. And He went on Democracy Now! as well. Mm -hmm. And here I am talking to you. (laughs) Yes. So I'm satisfied that it's reaching the people that it needs to reach. Um, Well, one of the things that struck me when I was reading this book, and I I connected it in my head to uh, books by Johan Hari and a bunch of other things that I've read, both for this podcast and just recreationally myself, is that a genuine sense of community might be one of the, the best bulwarks against the ills of society. And I, yeah, a thing that clicked for me as I see more and more of my friends, I would say like four of my closest friends have been diagnosed in the last two or three years with ADHD. And what I've noticed is that they get a great deal of satisfaction and comfort and community by bouncing their experiences off of one another. It's very interesting to me that these diseases, quote unquote, these disorders, these specific things that make a person not normal are turning out to be little enclaves of community and belonging. Sure. Well, if if you look at how we're wired, we're wired for community and belonging. Yeah. 
If human evolution was represented by an hour on a clock, we've lived outside of hunter-gatherer small band communities for only the last maybe six minutes, if that. Mm -hmm. And every creature, every organism evolves to match its environment, which means given the planet we're born onto and what human beings are capable of and are, are for, which is, you know, emotion and thought and creativity and purpose and meaning. We're the only animals that can make meaning. We have certain requirements and community is one of them and cooperation is one of them. That doesn't mean that capitalism invented murder or even exploitation, but in terms of what was normalized and what was required, at least a certain amount of togetherness, that's how life was experienced. That's how meaning was made. That's how food was found and shared and stored Hmm. and livelihood. And that's how kids were parented, right? So our brains expect that. So when we get it, it's a balm for whatever we're dealing with. Now, some of us learn to distrust community. I have a certain amount of Groucho Marx in me. You know, I wouldn't want to be a part of any group that would have me. Same. You know? Yes. I mean, you can have a kind of idiosyncratic uh, loner spirit to you where, where there's a kind of you need independence, you need solitude. But that doesn't mean we don't need people. And I have to make sure that I keep that part of me fed. I should also say that we could have called the book The Myth of Abnormal hmm. because part of the central idea of the book is that in a society such as ours, it's absolutely normal and natural to get sick. Yeah, These things are not abnormalities or aberrations or inexplicable mysteries. They are normal, natural, human, physical, emotional, spiritual consequences of an abnormal, unnatural set of conditions. Yeah. Which means that even the notion that, oh, there's something wrong with me, or I have a disorder, or I have a disease, there are other problems with the idea of disease that get in the way of the healing, which is the subject of the last part of our book. The idea that it's an individual problem that is manifesting in this one sick body ignores the body politic, the community body, the emotional collective dimension, you know, the nervous system of society, which is stressed and which we're all at the receiving end of. We're all downstream from it. Mm -hmm. And some people are going to manifest the ills of our society, the discontents of our society in certain ways. People have different temperaments. People grow in different ways. Mm -hmm. And some people get to float above the surface of it, seemingly not suffering that much, but we never know what people are dealing with. Absolutely. We've gone really, really macro and I like that. But it also shows that this this toxic society, toxic culture, it's so big and it's so much bigger than just an individual. So knowing all of that and knowing that, honestly, grand scale systemic change probably is not going to happen in either one of our lifetimes. Mm -hmm. How can we change our approach to ourselves and orientation to the world in a way that that helps us cope? Well, first I would say we don't need help coping. Coping is what we're already doing. Mm. I think that's important. I've heard it said uh, by Stephen Jenkinson, who's a wonderful Canadian writer, that you know the three things our society is addicted to is hope, dope, and cope. <sighs> mm -hmm. So learning to cope better is one thing, and there's nothing wrong with it. But ultimately, healing is the aim. Mm. And healing just means a movement towards wholeness a movement away from fracturing and kind of splitting from each other and within ourselves towards something closer to what we were born for, which is meaning, purpose, autonomy, self-knowledge, cooperation, connection to nature, like domestic pets. I just heard a, a, <laughs> yeah. a cat. The, the cat back. has entered the chat. Yeah. <laughs> my, my little beloved cat, Clara, just came in and was like, what are you doing in here? So then... We have to start from where we're at. We have to take a sober look at what are the illusions I'm carrying? Mm. What are the things that I've normalized? Well, that they have served me, but they served me to survive under conditions that are no longer there. I'm not a small child anymore. Mm. And what are they costing me now? How do people know what those things are, though? Uh, they can listen to their bodies and look mm. at what their, how their minds are doing. Mm. You know, there, there are exercises in the book. One is called Before the Body Says No, mm -hmm. which is a play on the title of one of my dad's earlier books, When the Body Says No. Mm -hmm. Starting to sensitize yourself to your body signals that you just think, oh, the backache is normal or the headache is normal right. or the 
feeling sick to my stomach before I talk to this person is that's just me. Well, maybe, but what might it be trying to tell me? Yeah. I keep wanting to put the word intuition into this conversation. I've been thinking about it a lot lately. And intuition is is one of those things that we've just stuffed down as a consequence of having to conform to this idea of normal. That's right. And at an even more literally visceral level than intuition would be its its neighbor gut feelings. Yeah, right. Yeah. Like more primal than just a hunch. Mm-hmm. Like you think of intuition in terms of solving complex scientific or math problems or something, you know, intuition comes. But a gut feeling often doesn't even have any mental content. Mm -hmm. It just is like, there's a predator around the corner. I can sense something is off or something is wrong. That is not superstition. That's the body knowing something itself, a kind of second or or third brain, if you count the heart. And many Mm -hmm. people who have studied the biology of this would say that all three of these systems have their own kind of information processing. Yeah. Even knowing how we feel, never mind honoring it or trusting it. Often we walk around numb, not feeling what we're, what our bodies are feeling and that energy has to go somewhere. Yeah. How are you at, at tuning into your gut feelings? In some ways I'm quite good and in some ways I'm limited. I'm only now learning how to listen to what my body is saying mm. as just bodily sensation. Like the somatic frontier is the final frontier for me, I think. Yeah. I can tell when something's amiss in my mind. Like I know how I think and perceive when things are aligned and I know what the voices in my head sound like when they're not. Mm -hmm. And then if I notice, oh, I'm tired, I'm ill at ease. Mm -hmm. And if I really let it slide and I don't listen to it, it'll get more and more extreme. But I have found myself in situations where my coping patterns, my I'll push through this, my it's not a big deal, my I'm okay, well, it's their fault anyway, so what can I do about it? You know, my victim story mm. has resulted in serious physical consequences. Mm. And that happens for many people. I was talking to someone the other night who had cancer 10 years ago. She's pretty young. And like many of the people in our book, they count cancer and other diseases as the best thing that ever happened to them. Obviously, it's not the kind of teacher that we would wish for anybody, but it was a wake-up call. Mm-hmm. It was the body speaking louder than, or the body speaking as loud as it had to. So I'm getting better. I'm getting better through catastrophe. Mm -hmm. If I'd been better at trusting my gut feelings, there would have been situations that I probably would have sidestepped, but I didn't. I only knew what I knew. And these hard lessons don't mean us any harm ultimately. And treating it that way is one way that I try to juice it for all of the nutrition that's there so that I don't have to go through it again. Yeah. There's um that construct of this is not happening to me or it is, but it's also happening for me. That's exactly right. Yeah. And what can I learn? How can I, how can I actually make this useful for me in the future? I think that's one of the most important things that I'm slowly starting to come around to mm-hmm. as I get older. And if there were one thing that you wish people understood about the toxic culture that we're living in, that you just don't think they get, if you could scream it from a rooftop, if you could broadcast it everywhere and have people really let it sink in, what would that thing be? Well, I mean, a few things would be it's not personal. Mm. It spares no one. So it's not just you. It didn't start with you. This has been going on for a long time. So whatever you're dealing with at the receiving end of culture's consequences, it's specific to you. Whatever you're dealing with is specific to you, but it's not personal to you. It didn't start with you. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not your fault. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it ain't necessarily so. One of the things that makes human beings human is we can actually imagine, envision, and at the at our best, make things different than they are. Mm-hmm. As I think, you know, was it Margaret Mead said, you know, that the only time that's ever happened is when human groups of human beings have gotten together and dared oh, to dream oh. and wonder and imagine and question and create. It's going to start with each of us individually. There's no way around that. People getting together in groups has not always gone very well for human beings, as history, you know, obviously shows. But that's when human beings get together in groups and react and try to vindicate and try to assert a rigid sense of identity and that involves domination over others. But mm. we are capable of imagining something else. Mm. There is a sense in which we are reproducing the culture every moment. We are either succumbing to its norms and its dictates, or we're seeing through them and we're 
creating something else. So it's not set in stone, either on the group level and certainly not on the individual level and the small community, family, you know, relationship, workplace level. Mm. And it's not going to be easy for us to turn this thing around. Nothing's guaranteed. But as we say at the very end of the book, it's our greatest challenge and our greatest opportunity. And we get to choose if we want to live a life that's built around coping and surviving something that's bad for us, or whether we want to live it imagining something that might actually be worthy of us. Mm. Well, that is an inspiring way to leave it. So I think we should just leave it there. Daniel Mate, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks for joining me. It was a pleasure. Likewise, Caitlin. Thank you for having me. All right. Welcome to the bookend, where we end with books. And a little bit of chat about this interview, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I said at the top of this episode, I was really curious about how you see this fitting into the world of Gabor Mate books. I love one book in particular, which is When the Body Says No, Mm. and it's about the stress cycle. I've recommended it on Simplify roughly 8,000 times. If you haven't already gone out and read it, or if you haven't read the Blink on Blinkist, please just do it. It'll teach you a lot about stress and why your body does what it does and how to like protect yourself in your day-to-day life from, you know, combusting. Yeah. (laughs) If you're a stress case like me. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm less of a stress case now than I used to be, and part of it is because I read this book. But yeah, some of that research that was so important to me when I first read it also appears in this book and is a basis on which some of the arguments in it are are founded. So it definitely fits in. It's just a small part of this this book, though. This book is wide ranging. There's a whole huge chapter on childhood, but it starts with motherhood Mm -hmm. and what happens in vitro and how the stresses of the mother directly impact the child. So it's really, really like thorough. Yeah. And far reaching. But so what is like the one sentence encapsulation of when the body says no stress cycle? Um, don't get stressed. <laughs> listen to your body. <laughs> like, is listen it like, listen yeah. to your body and understand. And I, I think that actually Daniel says this at right. the end of the interview. You need to really start picking up on what your body's tells are because that wisdom is something that will keep you safe and keep you sort of like in your embodied physical values enough to not accept systemic demands on you that could be harmful. And if we all do a little more of that, then maybe there's a world in which we don't spontaneously combust, as I said earlier. Right. <laughs> but for me, the, the thing that, that I, I remember here and stuck out to me is that this idea that I think Daniel says, to some extent, we're all living in a society where how we cope with the lack of what we need is often what's taken to be a successful human life. Right. That makes me think immediately of all the GoFundMe's out there in place of healthcare. You right, know? right. And all the like, I don't know, all the times in my earlier life where I would, you know, work too hard or go to work too early, especially when I lived in the US and come back and then like stress eat a roll of cookies because that was making up for what I didn't have, which was relaxation and sleep and stress relief. So there's there are all these ways that, you know, we normalize consuming more and um And kind of like hurting ourselves to make up for the fact that we're lacking really basic human things. Right. It's like the best people at suffering are the ones that are normal. Yeah. And not just normal, but also... Successful. Successful, yeah. Like they're held up as these paragons of greatness. And it also makes me think about, you know, when Elon Musk did that big first round of Twitter slash X layoffs, you know? Right. If If you want to work harder or something. Yeah. And then half the company left, though. I mean, that is certainly an unnatural request on the human body. To do more coding? Do more coding. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And I like how Daniel explains that these are the way that we are being told that we are abnormal. So people with ADHD or people who are suffering from depression, et cetera, et cetera. These are completely normal results of abnormal societal conditions. Right. Yeah. I don't know. What what stuck out to you, if anything? Well, I kind of wanted to connect it to uh, the book that I brought. Okay. Because uh, you mentioned, I think, in the interview, Yohan Hari, and we talked to him in Simplify many years ago. He's written, his most recent book is Stolen Focus, Why You Can't Pay Attention, but he also wrote Lost Connections about depression and Mm -hmm. then, and before that, Chasing the Scream about addiction. Yeah. What we talked to him about was about community and other people and how important that is. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of the research that is often thrown about 
um, that like loneliness is more dangerous than smoking yeah. or something, right? Yeah. Like, and I don't know, there's a lot of angles on this. We can talk about AI or, you know, the ways in which Zoom and things allow us to connect with other people without actually seeing them mm. or allow more connection without actually, like there's two ways to do that. Mm. You know, you never have to actually meet somebody, but on the other hand, maybe it allows more meeting mm. for people in this age. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I kind of want to scratch that. Hmm. Another piece of research I recently came across was the importance of spontaneous small talk interactions, IRL. Uh huh. And I hate small talk, though. You hate small talk. Then again, no, I got to the office today and had such great small talk. It really made my morning. You got good small talk I today? I did. I got a lot of compliments. <laughs> oh, there you go. But that's kind of the point. So the research was something like when you, for example, only order groceries online hmm. and you never have to wait in line with anyone and you never have to go through that thing of confronting or having an exchange with a stranger in your city mm. ever necessarily. I mean, not even the delivery person, if they leave it out front of your door, you never have to have that moment of surprise when somebody actually does something nice for you mm. or, or is just a normal person. And I don't mean normal in the way of this episode, but I mean, just somebody who meets expectations and is kind and contributes to the world in which we all share. Mm. And without those, you can get a lot more paranoid about what people are up to. Yeah. Nice. My recommendation yeah, your rec? is very different. My recommendation is Do Scale by Les McKeon. And I was interested in Do Scale because Daniel and I talked a little bit about how um, scaling, like entrepreneurial business scaling, really takes a toll on the human organism. I'm looking at the blink right now to Do Scale. I'm looking at blink number five and it says... To successfully scale your organization, you must retrain your instincts. What does that sound like to you? Does it sound good or does it sound a little bit worrisome? It does a couple of things to me. One is it reminds me of this whole 10x phenomenon, mm. which is, you know, you want to scale. You, you find product market fit and then you scale it mm -hmm. and you have to scale 10x mm -hmm. if you really want to make a difference in the mm -hmm. market. Um, but also more recently, I think in May this year, Dan Sullivan, an author, brought out a book called 10x is easier than 2x how world-class entrepreneurs achieve more by doing less hmm. and it's sort of a focusing idea okay so um i think there's a misconception in the business world mm. there's a new book that came out of may 10x is easier than 2x by dan sullivan mm -hmm. that talks about like quality and quantity mm -hmm. so like in this world there's this idea like if we hire 10 times more sales people will do 10 times more sales that's not mm -hmm. true if i do 10 times more hours on this i'll be 10 times more effective definitely not true there's a point of diminishing returns. I think what you were looking for is this idea that we have to somehow break what's natural in order to reach the immense expanse and scale yeah. of what's possible in the exactly. digital, in the digital yeah. age. That's exactly what the connection I was making. Yeah. Break what's natural, including gut instinct. Um, there's this part of, of the blink that says, we cannot get enough of independent visionary leaders. We believe their phenomenal instinct for making astute, on-the-spot decisions is the cornerstone of their success. Um, yet in reality, scaling is a complex and rigorous process. It requires careful planning and a strong team. There's little room for gut instincts. And I thought it was kind of interesting because um, this blink goes on to say how if you're going to be successful, you have to retrain your instincts away from intuition and away from um, gut decision making. And Dan and I talked about that too a little bit at the end, how intuition and gut are things you need to follow in order to sustain human life, but we're being told to do the exact opposite in order to scale businesses. And that's kind of an interesting tension. And I think this is a good read because it's good to be aware of this stuff. It's mm -hmm. not like we're going to escape it. We have to like, you know, earn paychecks and pay our rent and work in the and society that we have. And grow your business. Yeah, sure. exactly. But it's it's worth it to understand that you're in a system that is asking you to do something that might be kind of unnatural and just make note of that. On that note, I wanted to say, I wanted to credit one of the smartest people I know for part of this interview that I did. Yeah. Her name's Angela Natividad. She is a, a writer and a thinker and has been a good friend of mine for a long time. But she and I talked about the myth of normal and I, I think I quoted her directly in one of my questions. And she also wrote a pretty amazing book that was a, a dissertation, actually. It's called Remember His Name, Unmasking the Faceless God of the West. And it's about capitalism and how capitalism we kind of treat currently as a god, yeah, like a, a mythological deity up there. And it's a really cool book. If that's your bag, go get it. Angela Natividad, Remember His Name. Nice. Yeah. The only path for me out of this 
is finding the compromise and the ways through yeah. scale, capitalism, growth with the needs of your instinct and your body and everything else. And mm -hmm. I, I don't think that they have to be mutually exclusive. No. It, it does require a different set of tasks, right? An organization that's built to find product market fit isn't necessarily the organization that's going to scale 10x. I think that the needs and the, and the way that you present in the, in the body is different depending on the task and mm -hmm. requires, has different needs, shows different things. Isn't this the whole, when your body says no, the environment matters. Mm -hmm. For example, maybe you are somebody who's more comfortable in a 10xing kind of moment, or maybe you're somebody who's more comfortable in a creative chaos zero to one kind of moment. The important thing is knowing where you stand and what your body is telling you and mm -hmm. finding ways to listen to that. Yeah. And for leaders to be able to do that. Absolutely. And just understand the trade-offs you're making. That's it. I guess that's what we're really saying here. Right. Like the myth of normal is, you know, it's out there. But what we can do as people is just understand the compromises we're making and understand how the systems that we're living in and the environments that we're in affect us yeah. physically. I think that's right. Cool. So the that's Mates that. do it again. The Mates do it again. Check it out. Yeah, Daniel wanted me to let you know that he does walks with Daniel, his mental chiropractic thing, which sounds pretty cool. I kind of want to do a session. For sure. And yeah, I hope that you enjoyed this interview. We were so excited to get to talk about this. And that's it. Simplify is produced by me, Caitlin Schiller, Ben Schumann Stoller, Phoebe McIndoo, Stefan Obadia, and Maria Levichik here in Berlin, Germany at Blinkist HQ. If you want to try out Blinkist free for 14 days, you can go ahead and go to Blinkist.com slash friends um, and enter the code normal. All right. Until next time, check it out. Check it out. See ya.